watching the Forefront Church video podcast. And wherever you're at viewing online, we just want to say thank you and welcome. And one of the ways that we can help connect with you is we want to hear from you and where you're at and how we can help. And so head over to ForefrontChurch.info after the message and click the Connect tab. It's a great way for us to help you along your spiritual journey as you connect with God and learn about Jesus. And so sit back, relax. We hope that you're challenged and encouraged from today's message. How many of you, as you drive around your neighborhood and you've noticed this, there's that one house that just honestly looks like they have done absolutely nothing to it. It's not kept up. Things aren't going well uh, for it. And you have questions about what's going on there. How many of you guys have that house in your neighborhood? All right. It's, it's good to see those hands. And if you didn't raise your hand, then that might be your house. Um, that there, there may be the case. And so we're not going to point fingers, um, but just, you know, be self-aware. There's definitely those moments where, and it happens in our neighborhood as well. We actually live next door to that house in the neighborhood for, for quite some time when the people were living there. You would look at it and the lawn wasn't kept very well and then it would grow and grow and grow and you'd see them walking out. You go, hey, how's it going? And he knew that I was a pastor so you can't probe too much because I'm like a professional Christian and how I word this may not go well because I'm looking at him like, bro, what are you It's like, hey, how's it going? Hey, what, what do you got planned today? And I'm hoping one of the things is, hey, I'm going to mow my lawn. He's like, ah, nothing. I'm just going to hang out. I'm like, oh, cool. And, um, and so you would see the flower beds and they really... It was misrepresented because there were no flowers involved and um, there was overgrowth and stuff. And you just kind of, and it, it really was not from a, you know, from a judgmental side. It was just kind of like, why? Like what's going on there? And I had the opportunity uh, at one point to kind of get an inside glimpse into the fact that it was not just something that was happening from the outside, that there was something bigger was leaving one day with the family and saw uh, a gentleman that was uh, had fallen down in his driveway. And so I stopped and said, hey, sir, are you okay? Helped him. He's like, no, I'm not a much older gentleman. They were taking care of him. It was the parent of one of the people living there. So, hey, can I help you inside? And as I helped him inside, that's when it hit me. The uh, immediately smelled uh, the smell coming from the home and, uh, and saw it was not like at the level of like intervention or like uh, even some of the shows like a uh, hoarders or whatnot, but it was pretty, it was pretty intense. And as I helped him kind of around and got him in his chair, puts on his machine and are you okay, sir? I'm okay. Okay. And, uh, and I don't know that he could even verbalize what had happened that I don't think when they come home, if, if he, if he could even tell them that I helped him into the house, uh, far further along in years. And so get in the car and immediately tell my wife, Hey, I'm, we got to call somebody. So we call adult protective services. Like, Hey, this isn't okay. Like he's not in a good spot and this isn't healthy for him. And so a couple weeks later go by and there's a, one of those like dumpster things in the driveway and they're cleaning out the, the house. And so we see that people have visited and because I'm sure that he wasn't able to even articulate it. Like we were still on good terms because you never know like what's going on. And so I say hi to him, whatever. And he says, hi. And so I walk over as they're cleaning out stuff. And I said, hey, um, it looks like you got a lot going on. He's like, yeah, it's just overwhelming. There's a lot of stuff. And um, man, it's just difficult to wade through it all. And honestly, it's gotten so bad, like inside the house and, and even in the garage here, like at some point, I just don't even want to do any of it, you know? And, and I didn't think to myself in that moment, man, this guy's lazy. What he was saying as we're talking and we're having this conversation, what he was really saying is like, man, I'm, I'm overloaded. And it's moments like that in this gentleman's life and, and in your life that we even do this series. And we started this a few weeks back 
where we wanted to look at, especially getting into the holiday season, we're getting ready to celebrate Thanksgiving this week. And so I hope that you enjoy your Thanksgiving. You maybe have, you're maybe traveling to family and you're like, you're excited or maybe you're traveling to family and you're like, no. <laughs> like you're just, you don't want to go, or you have family coming in that you maybe feel that way, or you're excited, but there, it, this is kind of ushering in the season where many people feel like the weight is too much to bear. And it's a reminder as we get to the end of the year and we get into this moment of the things that we enjoy, the things that we feel we've kind of lost along the way. Uh, the moments where we just go, man, that isn't traveling with me into this next year, and that's hard, and I'm processing that. And so it's a difficult time where we can feel very overloaded. And we started in the first week looking at our work well, in kind of the task-driven society where we got to get it done and we got to work hard, which is true. We should work hard. We should be diligent in that. But that shouldn't be our focus of our worship that our job is like the thing. And then we talked about the healthy boundaries to be someone who has a job or has tasks or has things to do, but that God is the one that we strive to honor in all that we do. And we have healthy boundaries. That The second week we talked about our thoughts, the ways that we can mill over things and almost cripple ourselves by getting so wrapped up in our head about the things that we're doing, the things that we're succeeding, the things that we're failing at, that it almost overwhelms us. And we talked about basically having a demo day where we would wreck all those thoughts and take them captive and think about what's true, about what God wants for you and I. And Dan last week did a phenomenal job talking about about our schedules and how busy we are. We kind of wear that as a badge of honor. And then all of a sudden, like everything hits the fan and we hit that emergency button that he had sitting up here. And we just go, man, ah, what's happening? It's overwhelming. And go, man, could it be that we need to dial it back and look at moments to press pause and see the outliers in advance and know, you know what? I can only take on this much and this is how much my bucket can get filled. And if there's anything that goes over that, I just can't do that. I'm going to have to let somebody else do that. But I know for me, I can't process it that way. And so we're going to do this. As I was talking with that guy, my next door neighbor, and he was sharing some of this stuff. I didn't think that in the state that he was in, he was dealing with laziness. But as he began to unfold it, What I started hearing was early on in the onset stages as he saw things, there was a little bit of, I can wait to get to that. I can wait to get to that. And then all these things started piling up and it went from laziness to feeling overloaded. Then he just goes, there's no way I can handle all this. And he was buckling under the pressure. And we want to look at today this concept, this idea, this lifestyle of laziness and does it honor God? Does it honor God to move in that way? And if it doesn't, how can we overcome some of those things? I love the way that Thomas Edison puts it. He shares with us that we often miss opportunity because it's dressed in overalls and looks a lot like work. And I think that's true. I think there's things in our life that we just go, man, I'll eventually get to that. And then when we see that there could be movement, we go, oh, I want to. And we go, ooh, that looks like it's going to be difficult. Now, before we get into all this, I know that the temptation is to look at, and this is generational. The temptation is to look at a generation younger than you and say, oh, well, we know, but, and if you've ever thought that way, especially about millennial generation, um, my wife is a part of that millennial generation. I just miss it by a few years. And I want to encourage you, if you're a believer especially, but in just general humanity, man, we got to stop with the bashing of the generation that comes after us. It's not healthy. It's not okay. And it doesn't honor God. God. And let's be honest, when we talk about these missed opportunities that are dressed in overalls and look like work, if you look at, because people say, oh, the millennial generation this, millennial generation that, some of the most generous people in the world fall in the generation of millennials. Some of the people that are pressing this movement forward in helping humanity and coming up with nonprofits and moving in ways, using technology and harnessing that and coming up with new ideas to help mankind are millennials. And I'll tell you what, some of the most forward thinking men and women who are pushing the movement of Jesus forward and helping mankind at large are millennials. 
And so I've watched people that are lazy who are younger, and I've watched people who are, I won't say older, seasoned in life that are lazy. And when we talk about these often miss opportunities because they're dressed in overalls and look like work, we want to make sure that we honor God and go, you know what? I don't want to be someone who's known as lazy because you will be, when you begin to follow Jesus, the only Jesus that some people ever see. And what Jesus are you carrying out to others? Are you carrying a lazy, narcissistic, angry, bitter, sarcastic Jesus to people? Or are you bringing a Jesus to people that mirrors the very true nature of Jesus of love and grace and mercy? And, and I want to say out of the gate that if you have encountered someone who claims faith, who portrayed something other than the Jesus of the Bible and the one who walked, talked, moved, lived, and breathed with mankind, I want to say I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you've encountered someone like that because we, especially here at Forefront Church, strive our very best to equip this church across all services in this community so that we will be people that live out like Jesus in a way that, that encourages people and doesn't look something other than, especially when it comes to how we live our life out, whether we strive and do it in a great way or this laziness factor that would show people, man, you don't even care because you don't even try. And the Bible records some moments like this. And if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to turn over to Proverbs 24. It's in the Old Testament of the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, you can stop at the Get Connected table in the lobby, pick one of those up. Or if you're more digitally inclined and you'd rather do that, ForefrontChurch.info. And I get a lot of questions from people going, man, what's the .info page? ForefrontChurch.info is a digital version of this. So when you're like, we're only here like an hour and change together, but 24 seven, you can get to everything here right there on a mobile device and on your desktop. And so you could save that. If you swipe all the way across, you could save it to the home screen. If you have an iOS device, you can click that. If you have an Android device, there's like three little dots and it'll help you do it that way. But save that and use that. There's small group studies and previous messages in the notes section about what we're talking about today. We wanna give you tools that you can use use them. They're free and it's the ability to do that. And in this passage, the writer over in Proverbs 24 talks about what we can learn from living a life in faith and out at large that isn't lazy, but that strives to be better. And it starts in verse 30. It says, I went past the field of a sluggard. That's uh, another way of saying someone who was living lazy, someone who didn't uh, take charge and, and you know, really harness uh, the power to be able to work and take action. It says, pass the vineyard to someone who has no sense. The thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds and the stone wall was in ruins. And so immediately we see from this that this isn't something that happened overnight. He doesn't know there was a big storm and all this stuff happened and the yard looks really bad and this field looks awful. This is something that took time to happen. Kind of like in talking with my neighbor, this isn't something that just happened like one day he woke up, the yard was awful and the inside was awful. It stair-stepped over time. And sometimes we just look at it and go, oh, I can get to it later, but there's something in being diligent. And so the person continues. So I applied my heart to what I observed and learned a lesson from what I saw. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity, having very little, like an armed man. Now, I, I want to point this out because what this writer is not saying is that if you take a nap, that your whole house will come to ruin. All right? Even Dan talked about last week that sometimes the best thing that we can do when we lead a life of busyness and overwhelm nature, just feeling just overloaded, is to pause and rest to take a nap. And I've said this before, sometimes the most spiritual thing you could do is take a nap. And so today when you're like, man, I got to do whatever. Jason said, I need to take a nap. Jesus. And so just go down, lay down, take a nap. If now, now don't negate that. If there's things that you need to do and things that you promise, don't go back on your word because yes, we could take a nap. But if we have family responsibilities that we know that we need to be a part of, we need to handle those. If yes, we can rest and pause, but if there's things that are going on at work that genuinely need our attention, then we need to go out those. Yes, we can rest, but if there's a relationship that is rocky, that we know that we need to repair and there's some work that needs to be done, 
We need to do that because yes, we can rest, but the moment that we rest to get away from what we need to be doing, it is no longer rest, it's neglect. And we cannot neglect the things that God has called us to, because that's what leads to this overloaded life. And that's why I don't want any of us to be in that place. And I love the encouragement of George Herman Ruth, or you and I might know him as Babe Ruth. He said, it's hard to beat a person who never gives up. And he lived this out. And people, even his teammates would go like, man, you're making us look bad. Because when he would, the game would start and he, they would run onto the field and he would run on. And you expect everybody to run on when it's the beginning of the game. And they get done with the inning, he'd run off. And he'd go up to bat and he would be swinging for the fences. And then you'd get to the fifth inning, sixth inning. Then he's running off the field and running back on the field. And his teammates are like, bro, you're making us look bad. Like, just walk off the field. It's okay. Like, we're going to make it to the dug. I said, nope. Every single time, game after game, season after season, running hard and going hard. People are like, why do you do this? You say, every single game, there's somebody sitting in the stands. It's their very first game. And I will not disappoint someone that's looking at me saying, man, I've heard about this guy. I want them to know that this matters. And when it comes to faith, there are people watching you. Remember, we said, you may be the only Jesus if, as you follow him that anybody will ever see. And they're watching you, your family, your friends, your neighbors, the people that see you because you have that forefront sticker on your car and you're changing lanes erratically and driving entirely too fast. And then you pull up to the restaurant and you're wearing the forefront shirt and you walk in and you're angry about your meal and you say all kinds of things and they go, huh? And you turn around to leave and they see forefront.org on the back and they go to the website and go, oh, yeah, it's one of them. You see, you and I leave a legacy wherever we go and how we move and everybody. And we do not need to give up the person that hustles, the person that works hard. Now, I'm not saying, because we talked about in the first week, worship work, but that you and I would be someone that sets an example, that when they see us, they go, man, that person says they love Jesus and they actually do it. Unfortunately, at the world at large, the people that don't follow Jesus expect Christians to be lazy. Expect Christians to be judgmental. Prove them wrong. And that example, as we move through that, is no better illustrated in in my life, and I've watched this happen, than when you enter the restroom. How many of you have ever walked into the restroom and there was no toilet paper? Yeah, some of you. You're like, I guess I'm allowed. Are we allowed to say that in church? Yes, you're allowed to say that. And there was a time, and I remember it vividly, I, in a department store I walked in, and there was no toilet paper. And then you're just like, uh-oh, what do I do? My wife was working. I have nobody to call. And so you immediately do what you should do, which is look under the stalls and make sure there's no one there. And then you have to do the waddle of shame, where you move quickly to the next stall, and you get there, but you're not even check. You don't have time to check and leave the door open. You run in, and you should close the door and check, and sure enough, there's no toilet paper at that one. And so then I'm like, all right, you do the second look, you do, and of course, that the third one I finally found, it's toilet paper, all is right with the world, and uh, I let an employee know. But man, there, that's okay. Like, if I don't find any, that doesn't make me as mad as when I go into the restroom and I find this right here. Because what this says is somebody thought about you and they thought this was enough to handle business <laughs> right here. And this happened to me recently at my house. Uh, one of our, our daughters walked in, did what they needed to do, left. And, and I knew because I heard what was going on. And then I came in and I sat down and then I looked over and there was this. And man, I was, I was heated, boy. And I wasn't going to call on anybody. They had been downstairs playing. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to figure it out. I'm not going to explain to you how, but I figured it out, okay? I'm a grown man. I can handle business. And so I figured it out, but I did not leave the role that I found in there. I left this. And I went back into my room to do some work at the desk. Then I hear somebody walking into the restroom, same person that left it there before. And I wait, and I wait, and then I hear, Daddy! Like screaming, Daddy! And I'm just smiling, because I know what's going to happen. And so I walk up to the door, and I'm standing outside, hey, yes, I need some toilet paper! I'm like, oh, you do? I said, I need you to look to your right. I look to my right. There's, there's only a little slice. I said, do you know who left that there? Who's the last person to use the restroom? You were. And I said, oh, really? I said, who was using the restroom before me? And then I hear, oh. So yeah. S can you give me some though? Like for real, whatever. And I'm not going to torture her. So I throw the toilet paper in there. And she comes out. 
And I said, I want to talk to you for a second. This has nothing to do with, with the roll of toilet paper that you left. So this has everything to do with how you treat people. She's like, what? And this is, this, these types of things we try to encourage. And you'd be like, man, living under a pastor's roof, it's like a sermon all day long. Um, and, uh, but my hope is, because here's what I know. When I did years of student ministry and I'd talk to parents 16, 18, early 20s, and they go, man, if I could go back, I would change some things. And so she walks out of the bathroom. I said, hey, the... The, me asking you for and bringing the toilet paper and all this stuff and then the lesson, hey, uh, it has nothing to do with the toilet paper rule. It says everything to do with you thinking about the person that comes next. It's like, I hope that when you're at class and you go to the paper bin for your class and you find there's one sheet left, that you're going to go to your teacher say, hey, we're going to need to refill this because we need to do whatever. That you, when you're in gym and the teacher says, ah, we're all done, and every kid leaves the playground ball there, that you stop and pick it up. And she immediately goes, well, the gym teacher's supposed to do that. And I said, but I want you to help. And I said, eventually you're going to get to a job and there's going to be somebody who asks you to do something. And I want you to do it so well that the person behind you goes, I didn't even have to come in on my next shift because you did it well. And then when you come along a coworker and they need help, that you'll come alongside them and your boss is going to see that. Your boss is going to ask why. And way back here, you were learning lessons about what it meant to think about other people before yourself. And I know this is simple, and I'd rather you learn this lesson around a little roll of toilet paper than when you get to your marriage and you wonder, I need them to do, and I need them to whatever, and I need that you would stop and you learned enough lessons along the way to go, how can I care for, serve, and be selfless to them? So this has nothing to do with the toilet paper. It has everything to you about you working hard and not being lazy. I don't want you to be lazy in your relationships and in your work. And let's learn that now so you don't have to learn it later when times are hard. You see, if we don't, overloaded laziness leads to spiritual bondage. It leads to you and I being shackled. And my hope and prayer is that we will choose action over atrophy sitting still and letting the muscles just begin to decompose and deconstruct and just get weak and instead daily taking action in who God designed us to be because the Bible continually records that living a life of laziness not only impacts our faith but impacts the ripple effect of the world around us. And over in Proverbs, the sluggard's appetite is never filled but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. I started writing in my notes that once you embrace laziness. You collapse under the weight of it because one moment gets lazy, I'll put that off. The second moment gets lazy, I'll do that later. The third moment gets lazy. Before too long, you are so heavy with stuff that you need to do, you almost invite more laziness in because the idea of working your way out feels so overwhelming that if we had just handled it then, and it's the same thing that happens in our habits, in our movement with God, and in our treatment of other people. We just go, I'll eventually get to that. Now, I'm not saying you can't have moments where you put stuff off. Remember, there's work and there's tasks and we need to have boundaries. So I'm not saying don't you know, put off folding the laundry. You can do that because you need to get down on the floor with your kids. If you're worshiping getting the task done instead of family, instead of being with people, that's a problem. But there needs to be a balance of thought, which is why all these come together. Say, you know what? I'm going to choose the moments that matter. And I know that I can't be lazy in certain things because there's a ripple effect. Diligent hands will rule, but the laziness ends in forced labor. It's so the idea of just letting it pass and letting it pass and building up and building up, I'll get to it because I don't want to work, actually gives you more work. It's more difficult to dig your way out. It's more difficult to work out an awful habit. It's more difficult to work out awful situation than it is to upfront deal with it and set a standard of following and moving. So you go, go on, I'll never walk down that road because I know how to handle myself. It's why the uh, words of James, the half brother of Jesus ring so true. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it, what? Says. Do what it says. He actually describes this as for some people when they don't move, it's like when they go and look into a mirror and then as they turn away, they forget what they look like. 
that you and I would say, you know what? I want to have an impact that is greater. And so I am always going to make sure that I work hard and work diligently. And here's a lie that we begin to believe. And I want to make sure, and especially if you are, are working, if you have little kids in your house, hear me out because I want you to call up a friend that has a 16, 18, 21 year old and ask them what they would do different. They would go, you know what? I wish that I could go back. And there's some things that I know now that would revolutionize the way that you parent. Talk to somebody who's in their 60s and 70s and ask them about relationships and what they would do differently. And they're going to go back and tell you the way that I treated people and the things that I would do and the things that I would say would be different now. The wisdom that is people who have been there before you to change things. And so as we look at this, I want us to know that laziness is not a habit. It, for you to say, oh, I just kind of got in the habit of putting it away. It is not a habit. It is a heart condition. It is a reflection of your, my, our spiritual maturity. That when we move in laziness over time and continue to do that. Now, when I say spiritual maturity, I am not saying that you know everything about the Bible and you are so smart and amazing and you could ace a test on all of the cover to cover. That is not what I'm saying. Because I've met people who know very little about the Bible that can memorize almost nothing. But man, they know what it means to not move in laziness and be diligent and care for other people. And on the flip side of that, I met people who are so smart and they, you, if, they, if you quizzed them book, chapter, and verse on anything, who actually don't know how to put it into practice. And so let's not equate maturity with knowledge. Maturity is actually putting it into practice. Whether you know a little bit or a lot, what do you do with that knowledge? That knowledge is saying, I've got his move me, move to me, and I'm going to put it into practice. And so I've looked through some of these things. And I say, if you don't put forth the effort, it may be because you care too much about the wrong things. That maybe you care too much about your job, about this, about that. And instead people go, man, that's lazy. Well, it might just be misplaced movement and you need to readjust and put, the, you know, move things around. And there's a possibility that maybe you don't care at all. And if so, ask those around you invite someone in, which is extremely difficult to invite someone in and go, Hey, I'd like for you. Is there any lazy way in my life within me? Like that's very vulnerable. And for most of us, we will not do that. And that makes me sad because that could be the change that you and I need to go. You know what? Is there any way in me that's different than what Jesus lived? And if there is, help me understand that so that I can be more like Jesus. Because if men and women who follow Jesus actually live that out and practice these principles. It doesn't matter who's in an office, uh, in government or in politics, you name it. The world would change drastically when men and women of God acted like men and women of God. And so for you and I, as we move in this, there is so much about this reflection of spiritual maturity that I would just say, man, let's, let's live honorably. In the way that we do that, the only way to combat laziness with heart transformation that leads to real life action. And I was reading this book recently. Uh, it's called Atomic Habits by James Clear. It says, because I ask people all the time, what are you doing to grow? What, like kind of what are your systems? What are you asking God to show you? If you look at your prayer life, are you asking God to do things? Or are you asking God to show you ways that you can move? Because the reality is it's not my job to make you grow. You might be like, but you're the pastor. It's not, my job is to introduce you to the life teachings and movement of Jesus, equip you in ways, and then you begin to do the work on your own. It's just like when you first get a baby and you're like, I got a baby. What am I doing? I got to feed him and do whatever. Eventually they like grow up and then you're like, oh, that's so cute. I can't wait for you to talk. And then they start talking. You're like, who told you how to talk? And like you run through and do all these things. And then they grow up and they get their own house. And it'd be like them calling you in their thirties going, hey, could you come over and give me a bottle. You'd be like, first of all, you don't need no bottle. Second of all, you need like food. You need steak. You can do it on your own. And for many people, they believe that, man, I just need all this extra stuff. And I would encourage you that in this movement of heart transformation to real life action, part of that is being able to take a hold of your growth and begin to do these pieces on your own. Yeah, that's why we need one another, encourage one another. But the only person that can begin to do that and make that commitment 
is you. And that's why it says you do not rise in this book that I was reading. You do not rise at the level of your goals because everybody's going to be making New Year's resolutions in you know, a couple months. Well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Goals. He says, you do not rise at the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. What is the system that you're putting in place to not be lazy and follow Jesus? Well, I'm going to follow Jesus. Okay, how are you going to do that? Well, I'm going to read what he did. Okay, you're going to read what he did. Well, then what are you going to do? I, I don't know. Well, go, hey, let's talk about something that you could do. He said to love. How are you going to love people? What's that going to look like? He said to, you need to practice generosity. What's that going to look like in your life? He said that you need to be diligent and not be lazy. What are some ways in your life that you're being lazy and we can combat that? How are we going to do that? That you have a plan so that you don't have this laziness that leads to spiritual bondage, but you're going to choose action over atrophy. And nothing, let's, you know, we, we, we started off, we were talking a little bit about this bathroom thing and these lessons that we learn. There's some lessons that we can learn in this. And there was one that happened recently. Um, my daughter, and if you have a little person in your home, you know, like talking about like four or under, if you've never had this, talk to somebody who has, they think that the toilet is like this just void of whatever that they can throw everything in. They just see it and they see people throw stuff in. They go, that's how it works. And they will throw everything in. And by everything, I mean everything. And so one day, one of the little people in our house decided, I'm just going to keep unrolling because the toilet paper's right here and the toilet's right there. And I can just pull the toilet paper and throw it all in there, all of it. And so they did almost an entire roll. Well, no one ever walks into the restroom and thinks, hmm, I should probably check the toilet to see if someone has emptied an entire roll in there before I sit down. Like you just don't, that's not your normal thinking until it happens. And so sure enough, one of the other kids walks in, does what they need to do. And then remember that same Dada, I hear a Dada, Dada, they're yelling. And I'm like, what in the world? And I get to the door. Hey, how can I, don't come in because then you're going to see stuff. And oh, I don't want you to see, but the toilet is not going down. It's only going up and it's almost to the edge. And remember, I'm like, well, I have to come in to help you. Like, oh, but don't say anything about it. Cause I don't want to do it. I'm like, fine. I'm not going to say anything. Like there's so many, cause my kids know, like if it relates to the bathroom or bugs, call daddy, mommy can handle like everything else. Cause she's a superstar. But like when it comes to that, she's like, mm -mm, call him. And so I hear this, I go in and I see, I'm like, what happened? I'm like, I don't know. There's whatever. And I see all this toilet paper. So I know it's like, it was your, it was your other sister. Don't worry about it. And I was like, well, uh, yeah, why didn't you use? And I look at the plunger and I pick it up, which by the way, this is brand new and, um, and never been used. And so I said, there, there's this plunger. Why didn't you use that? She's, I don't know. I don't know how to use this. All right. Life lesson. Let's show you how to use this. And so getting there and I'm like, you're going to do the thing, but all goes down. She's like, whoa, that was super easy. I will, like, now I know how to do that. I said, yeah. And so took the plunger by the handle, hand it to her, and she takes it. I said, hey, now you know how to do this. You don't need my help with this anymore. The next time it happens, you can do it on your own. You see, for many of us, we just want somebody to keep doing all these things for us. And, it, and I think it moves from even laziness to neglect. That we want somebody to do, do stuff for us. And, and I'm not, it's not a generational thing. It's a heart condition thing. That we would say, you know what? I want to follow Jesus and someone's given me the tools. And so what will you do with those tools? Will you just sit and do the same old thing you've always done or will you take action with those? Because it will revolutionize your life. I remember I was probably 18 years old when things started to transform in my life, when I started learning about these things, even though my parents took me to church for years, that God was doing something different. And it was not about the knowledge that I had. It was about putting it into practice and going, you know what? I want my life to be like those people that I've seen. And those people that I was seeing, they were taking hold of it and they were not lazy. They were moving in action. What if you were the hardest per person, hardest person uh, working in the room when it came to your marriage, when it came to your parenting, when it came to your friendships, when it comes to your job, when it comes to being a neighbor, that everybody, and I'm not saying to draw the attention to you, that when the people see your life, they go, man, there's something about you. And you go, man, I just God changed my life and, and I'm not going to be lazy. I'm going to work hard. 
We want to give you every bit of the tools possible. But you're the only one that can choose action. And my prayer is that you choose that over atrophy so that people can see Jesus through your life. Thanks for tuning in to the Forefront Church video podcast. Our hope and prayer is that this has left you encouraged and challenged you in your faith. And you might have some questions and some ways that you want to figure this out. And we want to help with that. Head over to ForefrontChurch.info. And there's a couple different ways that you can connect. Click the connect tab and let us know how we can be praying for you or a staff member can be contacting you this week. Maybe you have just been encouraged by this and want to support the ministry here at Forefront Church. You can click the giving tab as well as other tabs that are in there to help you along in your journey with God. And so we're thankful for you. Thanks for tuning in. And we cannot wait to see you again here online on the video podcast. We love you and we'll see you then.